Welcome to our talk. And today I'm going to talk about how to embed information into text document. Let's start by looking at the information embedding techniques in general. Perhaps the most commonly used information embedding techniques are the barcodes. They are literally on every today's product. It allows the scanner to quickly retrieve the information about the product. Another example is the QR code, which has been widely used for mobile payment, posters, and digital name cards. In all these examples, the optical code which carries the information is visible to our eyes. Meanwhile, other techniques can hide the embedding information without notice. For example, when you take a photo using a digital camera, the photo contains not only pixel colors, but also some extra information called the metadata. The metadata records some information like camera type, exposure settings, and so on. It can only be viewed by some certain image viewer, but not, but not our eyes. Besides hiding information in images, another widely used, are used media are text documents. In this work, we focus on the question, can we hide information into text documents, whether they are digital files or prints on paper, such as posters and books? Hiding information in text, also known as text steganography, has a long, long history. Dating back to 400 BC, at that time, people used a special invisible ink to write hidden messages. And those messages can only be reviewed when the paper is painted by a specific material. In today's digital era, similar to the image metadata, PDF documents also have its own format of metadata. It can store author name, publication dates, and so forth. But those information can only be extracted by a certain specific software, such as Adobe PDF Reader. And the embedding information will be completely destroyed if you convert the PDF into an image or print it on a piece of paper. And in the research community, there are also some work on embedding message in digital files. One option is by changing the spacing between each character. For instance, regular spacing represents bit 0. Large spacing represents bit 1. Another is to change the character size. Large characters indicate 1. Small characters indicate 0. The third one is by changing the font. Each character uses a different font to represent the bit. All this method focuses on a specific format of digital document, such as Adobe PDF or Microsoft Word. So the character size or the font size is directly known from the title. But none of them has demonstrated how to retrieve the information from document that is printed on papers. In addition, they have limited coding capacity, usually one character for one bit. They also need to modify the original type setting, which means that one may have to rearrange figures and tables when using those methods. Lastly, they will largely change the appearance of the document. As you can see here, the document's aesthetic and our reading experience, reading experience would be compromised. And we are able to address all the problems. And here's our key idea. Instead of changing the whole font or tweaking the font size, we slightly perturb the shape of a single character. Here we use the term glyph to refer to the shape of a character. At encoding time, we perturb the glyph in a human non-obtrusive yet machine-readable way. Here are five characters with perturbed glyph. They all look the same at the first time. But there are some subtle differences if you look closely, like on the tail or on the head. So each perturbation can represent different information. At decoding time, our method recognizes perturbed glyph to extract information. More specifically, we first convert the document into an image. If the document is on a paper, we take a photo of this document and use standard optical character recognition algorithm, aka OCR, to extract single character. The OCR algorithm can extract the bounding box of each character and recognize them. Then for each character, we use a machine learning based classifier to recognize this perturbed leaf. And in this example, the extracted image has the highest probability associated with glyph 1. So the extracted image will be recognized as 1. And here is a preview of our embedding. 
One is the original text, and one has the embedding message. It is hard to tell which one is which, right? And here's the answer. The point here is that our embedding is unobtrusive to our eyes. The aesthetics is therefore preserved. Moreover, our method is format independent. Message can be embedded in digital and printed papers. Also, our method has large embedding capacity because for each character, it can have many glyph variants, which enable the character to embed more information. Lastly, unlike previous method, we are not changing the original type setting. So how do we achieve this? Let me start by overviewing our pipeline. The first step is a pre-computation step. For each character and the standard font, such as Times New Roman, we carefully choose a set of glyphs that are non-obtrusive to our eyes, but recognizable by our algorithm. Then we train a neural network to recognize those glyphs. The last thing is the encoding and decoding step. Our coding scheme allows us to recover the embedded message even if our glyph recognition has some errors. To this end, an interesting error correction coding problem arises. Now let's take a look at the glyph selection step in details. Our glyph selection is based on the concept of font manifold, which was first introduced by Campbell and his colleague in 2014. The font manifold is basically a parametric model to generate glyphs. Here on the left is a point moving on the 2D font manifold, and the corresponding glyph is shown on the right. Now our goal is to choose a set of points on the font manifold. The corresponding glyphs will be our perturbed glyphs in information embedding. If we perturb the glyphs largely, as shown on the right, they will be easily recognized by the computer, but also easily noticed by our eyes. On the other hand, if we perturb glyphs too subtly, as shown on the left, they will become hard to recognize by the computer. So we need a balance, the balance between human vision and computer vision. We want to identify a set of glyphs that are unobtrusive to our eyes, but recognizable by the computer. Then let me briefly go through our selection process. First, we need a set of glyphs that are perceptually similar. On the font manifold, suppose a standard font, say Times New Roman, is at the origin. As we sample a point further and further away from the origin, we get more and more different glyphs. But the manifold distance doesn't necessarily reflect the difference in human perception. Thus, we learn the perceptual difference through our crowdsourcing user study on Amazon Mechanical Turk. This gives us a similarity distribution on the font manifold. The lighter the color is, the glyph more similar to the original is. Next, we select a region where the perceptual similarity score is above a threshold. Then, we uniformly sample points in this region. In this way, the sample glyphs are perceptually similar so that they are unobtrusive to our eyes, but they might be too similar to distinguish by the computer. So we want to choose a subset of those glyphs, such as they can be robustly recognized by computer. Interestingly, this step can be formulated as a classic graph problem. First, the sampled points are nodes on the graph. Here we use fewer points just for illustrating the algorithm. And two nodes are connected by, a, by an edge if their corresponding glyphs are distinguishable from each other. And how do we define the computer distinguishability? Well, we first render a set of image of the two glyphs under different lighting conditions and use those images to train a neural network classifier. If the training accuracy is higher than 95%, we treat those two glyphs as distinguishable glyphs. Otherwise, they're indistinguishable. Then we test the distinguishability for all pairs of nodes, and we will get a graph like this. Wow, it's kind of messy. Um, but what we really want is that all glyphs in our final set are distinguishable from each other and the set is as large as possible in order to increase the embedding capacity. This means that we need to identify the largest subgraph that are completely connected. This is actually a classic problem in graph theory called maximum click problem. 
although it is known to be NP-hard, there exist several fast approximate algorithms, especially when the number of nodes is small. Please refer to our paper for details. And so we solve the maximum click problem, and we will get a very nice, clean, complete graph like this. And those are the final perturbatives that we want to use. We repeat this process for every character and store perturbatives in a database. Here is a result for Times New Roman. Notice that different characters may have different number of glyph variants. Some characters like I only had a few variants because it has a relatively simple shape. Here is a perturbed glyph for all 26 English characters for Times New Roman. And at this point, we have selected the perturbed glyphs. The next step is to enable computer to recognize them. To do this, we use both render image and real photos as training data to train a neural network classifier individually for each character. Given an image of glyph, the neural network classifier should be able to identify which perturbed glyph it represents to. I will skip the training details and leave the time for the next step, the message encoding and decoding step. Consider the, the encoding problem. We want to embed a message into the carrier text. A naive approach is first turn the message into bit string. Then we split the string into several blocks and convert each block into an integer. Then assign those integers to its corresponding character like this. And the decoding step is just the, the inverse of encoding process. But there is an issue if we use this method. What if we incorrectly recognize a glyph of some character, like this one? Then we're probably unable to recover the original text, since we can't guarantee that our machine learning recognition is 100% correct. This would make our decoding process vulnerable. So we need an error correction coding scheme. Traditional error correction coding, like Reed Solomon code, is based on Galois field. Basically, it adds some redundancies. So that when error occurs, it can still recover the message using remaining blocks. But it, it requires every coding block to embed the same number of bits. That's the fundamental difference from our problem here. In our setting, each character has a different number of perturbed leaves and thus different embedding capacities. This difference requires a fundamentally different coding scheme. Our coding method is based on the 17, is based on the 1700 years old theorem in number theory, namely the Chinese remainder theorem. Here's the high level idea. Suppose we want to embed an integer x into a word. We assign each character with an integer resulted from x modulo the capacity of each character. It can be proved that as long as the following condition holds, namely a, b, c, d, e are co-prime, and s is less than the product of a, b, c. We can always solve x by using any of three of those equations. Here we assume a, b, c are smaller than d, e. In practice, we divide the whole text document into blocks each have five characters, and each block can encode an integer less than the product of ABC. Furthermore, we propose a maximum likelihood decoding screen, decoding scheme to further improve the robustness. In this end, for a block of five characters, our method is guaranteed to recover the message with up to two arrows. For more detail about our coding scheme, please refer to the paper. Our method enables many applications. Here we briefly discuss three of them. First is the invisible QR code. Similar to QR code or barcode, our method can embed link, some links or IDs into text document. This link can be extracted by scanning the document. Here the advantage is that we can directly embed information into the original content without introducing any black and white patterns which may affect the aesthetic of the original design. Next is the format-independent metadata for text document. It's similar to the PDF metadata we mentioned before, but unlike PDF files, 
Our information embedding is format independent. Information can be retrieved even after the document is converted from PDF to a PNG file or printed on paper. Another interesting application is document forensics. For each part of the document, we embed an encrypted MD5 of the text to the corresponding part itself. Once an unauthorized third party modified the talk document, the extracted MT5 will not match the MD5 of the text itself. Thereby, we can detect the tampering. And now we are opening the modified file. And even if the document is printed on paper, our method can still detect the tampering. You can imagine that this will be useful for protecting legal documents. With that, let me conclude my talk. We have introduced a new technique for embedding additional information in text documents. The embedding is format independent. We can decode from either a digital file or a photograph of the printed document and we develop a new error correction coding scheme to improve the robustness. However, our method also has limitations. First, our method relies on individual character be detected by OCR. If the detection fails, our method will not be able to recover the message. When a certain region of the document is contaminated by other our colors, or the document paper is heavily crumpled, our method will also fail. Also, similar to other text diagonal graph method, the hidden information will be destroyed if one retype this entire document in a different file. In the future, we also hope to use some state-of-the-art font model like GANs, VAEs, to improve the selection of preserved glyphs. Right now, our method focuses on English and can be readily extended to other alphabetic language. We are also interested in applying our method to logographic language, such as Chinese. I'd like to acknowledge all the people for helping improve and prepare the paper and our funding agencies for supporting our work. With that, thank you for your attention. We have a simple smart, smartphone demo just as we showed in the video. Welcome to check it out after the talk. We also have building a web application. Hopefully, it will appear in a month. Uh, please check our project website and stay tuned. By the way, this is a QR code linked to the project webpage. Of course, we hope in the future this QR code can be replaced by our technique. Thank you very much. Please walk up to the mic to ask questions if you're interested. While we're waiting for somebody to come, one question I had is you used Mechanical Turk to judge similarity. Yeah. Did you try to also get expert typesetters? They are very, very, very finicky about fonts. Did you ask them to also judge similarity, and did you arrive at a similar metric? Um, I'm sorry, could you repeat your question? So experts in typesetting really care about fonts, so when yeah. you change the shape of fonts, yeah. so MTurk workers are not as sensitive, yeah. uh, so the similarity metric, I imagine, will be different. Yeah, yeah, Have yeah. you looked at also getting experts involved and, and measuring? Yes, um, this, that's an interesting question. We haven't uh, asked for experts to judge the typesetting, the, the font, but, uh, I'm, but our purpose is that this can be uh, viewed by like normal people as they're working the Amazon Mechanical Turk. So, um, yeah, um, we hope in the future we can um, make, ask the expert to uh, examine our work. But I think it's during the normal uh, user study that work, works pretty well. Uh, hey, Phil Lewis, Stanford University. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is super neat. And when I see those uh, constellation points right, of mm -hmm. the, on the font, of the font, it looks a lot like wireless coding, right, or mm -hmm. modulation, like yeah. IQ modulation. Mm -hmm. In that world, though, we really think about noise. We think about here's what we were sending, but then there's noise in the environment which causes us to spread out. Yeah. You're trying to space out the constellation points. Yeah. So what's the noise model here? Like when I print, you know, paper has texture, things can change a bit. Like how do you think about then these constellation points in the context of the noise of the medium? Yeah, so the noise here, as we uh, do our experiment, we found that the texture of the paper or the screen is definitely be a noise part. But um, actually, when we decode those images, we first convert the, those images into binary images. 
that will cancel a lot of noise in our uh, real experiment. Okay. Uh, thanks for a very interesting talk. Mm -hmm. um, so I, my question is a bit similar to the last one. Mm -hmm. so, so how sensitive is your approach to the, the defects of the printer itself? Like the, the print, maybe the defect will print the phones a bit differently every time. So. Uh, yeah, uh, this, the thing here is during our neural network training, we test a lot of uh, different environment, like on print on, like on screen or on paper, and we also have some render images, okay. and we add those things together to make our system more robust. Mm. So that's why you need a machine learning. Yeah, 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 yeah. Great, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, hi, great work, mm. great, great work, mm -hmm. and because I like all the hacking stuff and security, and yeah. you, you are giving a really great tool for mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. And I have one question. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, the phone that you used, it was like a very detailed, like the letter, for example, the letter A, L, it mm -hmm. has this three peaks on every, um, every corner. But mm -hmm. like for example, have you ever thought on fonts that like the letter L is just a straight line? How could mm -hmm. you use your application on that kind of fonts? Yeah, um, in our experiment we did find that that some kind of character has very simple shape. Um, but And those, they have very limited capacity to embed that. And if like some phone have very limited capacity, we can just drop that char specific character. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Right. Yeah. Let's thank the speaker again, and you can ask questions after.